hyper-realistic blood. Found it at a yard sale. Stop. Stop saying these things! You're not even making sense! Happy Halloween! I think this is my first seasonal video, Wimpy Kid doesn't count. Creepy pastas, possibly the dumbest things on the planet that are responsible for mass cases of childhood trauma. I kind of earnestly love creepy pastas, as much as the vast majority of them are incredibly low effort and unintentionally funny. The fact they're still being made to this day of all of the same trappings and cliches that you've come to expect just keeps taking me back to the old days. In 2010, I was a child with, I'll be frank, shockingly unlimited internet access for my age, and while most of my time using the internet back then was spent playing Ultimate Flash Sonic and waiting for the next Some Call Me Johnny video, a good chunk of it was also spent reading creepypastas and watching videos about said creepypastas. And while Ben drowned resulted in many sleepless nights for my six-year-old self, I would very quickly fall in love with creepypastas. More specifically, cartoon creepypastas. I can see the face you're making and you know what channel you clicked on, right? The vast majority, or let's face it, nearly all cartoon creepypastas are categorized as lost episode creepypastas. Stories about disturbing and creepy episodes of otherwise completely innocent and kid-friendly cartoons that were finished but never aired. While an overdone and not very believable trope by today's standards, back then these utterly captivated my tiny mind. Even when they weren't all too scary, I still got some enjoyment out of them. Though admittedly that may be because of how good the presentation for many creepypasta videos were. You guys really know how to instill the fear of God in a six-year-old cartoon G. This video is from when I was 12, but ignore that. And honestly, there are some pretty popular lost episode creepypastas about popular cartoons, and not very many of them are good twist of the century. Creepypastas in general are definitely a product of their time and haven't really evolved past that, save for a few exceptions. It's part of why I love them, but there are definitely a lot of really ass creepypastas about cartoons. So to get in the mood for Halloween before I spend it watching Nightmare Before Christmas and Summerween for the millionth time, I thought I'd do a video going over some of them. With the exception of two out of five I've chosen to look at today, I do find these to be pretty earnest attempts at writing a creepypasta despite them being a uh, pretty ass. I love them for that. There's only two here that I think are exceptions where I wish that both sides of the writer's pillars are warm tonight. Trust me, we will get there. This is mostly just a bit of fun and a way for me to look back at a few creepypastas I'm familiar with. And no, I am not talking about Squidward's hyper-realistic, unalive, Gen Z are trying to cancel the word suicide creepypasta, because it's been done to death and YouTube seems to have a bloody conniption when it comes to showing this image these days, even though it's now in an official episode of Spongebob. <laughs> with that out of the way, let's get started with... You don't really see a lot of gumball creepypastas compared to other cartoons, do you? The grieving has always been a bit of a guilty pleasure of mine because when I was younger I genuinely found this sort of chilling. Then again I'm the same guy that had nightmares about Ben drowned when I was 6 years old so maybe I'm just a pussy. Nowadays it's painfully obvious just how much of it conforms to many lost episode cliches but I still have a soft spot for it. It's also one of the more popular cartoon creepypastas we're looking at today and even got so big that the show itself made fun of it in the most gumball way imaginable by essentially rickrolling everyone. I miss this show a lot man, I can't wait for the new season. But anyway, The Grieving is a story about a lost episode of Gumball that played entirely on some poor person's television early in the morning. Personally, I just wouldn't let this happen to me. At four in the morning, I'm traumatizing myself in less conventional ways, like playing Overwatch. No! The episode is about Darwin and Anais being abducted and subsequently killed in very gruesome and disturbing ways, and as you're reading, you just gotta wonder what the f kind of beef the grown-ass man responsible had with these literal middle schoolers. It goes into gruesome detail about the deaths of these kids too, like how they find Darwin with his eyes gouged out and find Anais' head in a box with the rest of her body's innards decorated on the trees of the forest. Honestly, it's good to know that the descriptions of these incredibly mutilated children would later serve as the main inspiration for Urban Spook. I don't need to explain why this is just ass writing and not scary. It's trying to be shocking with all the gory details, but it most all get out of you as a half-hearted wince before you realize, wait, oh my god, they said the thing! The hyper-realistic blood comes in with this steel chair! Like, I get what the intent is with this, as much as it's a meme. Trying to get you to picture how uncanny, unnatural the image that's being described is. A lot of good pieces of fiction that dabble in horror will get you to picture something unnatural and unnerving in your head. It's a good way to freak out and disturb the reader. But what the f*** does hyper-realistic blood mean? This is not an original critique, I know, everyone has made fun of this cliché for years, but it bears repeating. The episode ends with Gumball hanging himself in a classroom. Fun. And then after the credits is where things get real funky, as it shows a set of images that target the person watching the episode. The first one is of some guy in a Plague Doctor outfit, the second is a video of a cat's face being stepped on, and the third is of the poster's little brother being shot in the fucking head by their father. It doesn't even end there, either. The poster wakes up in the morning to their door being 
unlocked, their brother going missing with their parents being major suspects. And after this, we get the ultimate epic creepypasta move of dragging in the real-life creator of the show, Ben Beauclay, who explains in the poster that they had made the grieving to make fun of a co-worker he hated, who came to work depressed because his child was killed by a quote, crazed serial killer. Just incredible. He was apparently deeply sorry for making fun of his co-worker for having their child be killed, and buried the episode somewhere, being very confused as to how the poster had seen it, and that he only ever made the parts of Nicola Richard crying at the loss of their kids and not any of the violent gory deaths. And all of a sudden, Ben hops on the crack pipe and theorizes that the serial killer responsible for nabbing his co-worker's child found the tape and proceeded to edit it, which in this context basically means that this crazed serial killer it's also a professional animator who basically made an entire deranged episode of Gumball just to f**k off this one poor guy in particular. This is generational levels of hating. Sakuna could never match this guy's freak. Ben then desperately tells the poster he has no idea why there was a video of his brother being capped in the forehead at the end of the episode. And then that's the end. The grieving is still just as funny as I remember it being. The episode description itself is insane, but still standard fair creepypasta stuff. But it's when the episode ends that the entire pasta goes hog wild. This crazed killer secretly being a professional animator who just created an entire episode of a kid's show to creep out one person in particular is insane. And then suddenly the poster's parents are the ones responsible for the brother's disappearance? Like that's a curveball, but mother f you just made a calling card that puts the f***ing fandom thieves to shame. Why did the parents kidnap and cap their son in the dome? Short answer, it's a very poorly written pasta, but it is funny. One thing I'm iffy on though, it's involving the real creator of the show. A lot of lost episode pastas do this and it's incredible incredibly cringe when not handled properly because writing literal fanfiction about a real ass person doing terrible things is a psychotic. Don't do that. The funny Squidward creepypasta is like the most well-known one in existence, so let's talk about its far less impactful younger brother. Plankton got served, even if it was good, is still impossible for me to take seriously because the main image that's attached to this pasta is hilarious on its own, and also it was used in this one stupid meme that's been living in my head rent-free for the past two years. My wife is dead. But anyway, Plankton got served begins talking about how everyone is familiar with Lost Episode creepypastas and even directly references Squidward's fatal plunge, and how all the Lost Episode creepypastas are completely fake but this one is real. It focuses on an alternate version of the Spongebob episode One Course Meal, which for those of you unaware is one of the most infamous and hated episodes that Spongebob ever released, where Mr. Krabs finds out Plankton has a fear of whales and proceeds to torture him to the point where he attempts to kill himself, yet it's kind of f***ed up. And a fun fact for you, the original title of this episode actually was Plankton Got Served, and I really like the specific approach to a lost episode, taking an episode that already exists and using its unused title to imply that there was an original version of it that was much darker and is sometimes aired on accident instead of the official one. Everything in the episode is the same as the officially aired one, but begins to deviate to the point where Plankton is lying in the road waiting to get run over. This time, he refuses to listen to Spongebob and eventually a bus comes and hits him. This is where things with this pasta get more wild as Plankton wakes up on a single platform and he looks down into the darkness to see nothing but whales looking back at him, and above him is a single light which both represent heaven and hell respectively. Which for as much as I may make fun of this creepypasta, I'm imagining that image in my head right now and it goes hard as hell honestly. Plankton hears members of his family calling to him down in the darkness and he proceeds to jump straight down into hell ending the episode. The poster then reloads the page and only finds the officially released version of the episode. Honestly, I want to talk about this one because not many people do these days. Whenever you think of Spongebob creepypastas, you're guaranteed to only think of the obvious one. But in all honesty, while I don't think this one is that great, it's a lot better than Squidward's death with the oopsie. It's a lot less extreme and doesn't amp up the shock value too much, and for that reason alone it's a lot more plausible. And plausibility to me is usually the mark of a decent creepypasta. You can tell all the horrible, gory stories of children's television characters being mutilated all you like and everyone's gonna know that shit ain't real. Tell a story that isn't as extreme though, and focuses more on being eerily plausible, then that's a lot better in my book. Again, Plankton Got Served isn't great, but it has some good ideas and I can read this one and not be utterly baffled like I am with Squidward's unfortunate uh oh. Oh, Side Mouse is a classic. I know I did the Gen Z is trying to cancel the funny word bit earlier, but for this one I am going to have to censor every time I say the word side because trying to understand what gets your money stripped away on this platform is a task I would not wish on my worst enemy. Side Mouse is one of the most well-known creepypastas ever written, and I honestly don't think I need to describe it too much. I remember in primary school there was some kid in my class who used to bring it up and was clearly terrified of it. I think we should start a study about how many kids have been traumatized by some of the silliest horror stories ever written because the fact that I was hearing about creepypastas from random kids in primary school 
school is really funny. It's the basic Lost episode setup. Someone finds an old Lost Mickey Mouse cartoon, things get super spooky, and then it goes absolutely insane towards the end. Won't lie, this one did creep me out for a while, even in my teens, but it's nothing all too remarkable. I mean, I guess I can talk about how funny it is that some guy just watched a cursed Mickey Mouse cartoon that caused him to grab a guard pistol and- <laughs> What watching five episodes of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse does to a motherfucker. But really, I'd rather talk about the impact of Super <laughs> Mouse because it's very obvious that a lot of lost episode creepypastas have attempted to replicate it and tend to fall pretty short. Truthfully, it isn't that bad of a story, far more reserved than its reputation would have you believe. Still not good and very cliche, but this is one of the more popular creepypastas I've read that doesn't actively make me groan while reading it. I guess it also helps that it was made back in 2009, and a lot of my fondness towards creepypasta garbage is because of how they feel like products of their time. Something like this wouldn't turn many heads if it was made today, but that's why I like it so much. While likely not the first, this was the original Lost Episode Creepypasta for many people, and I think the fact it's lasted for over 14 years and is still talked about today is kinda neat, honestly. While the scare factor may be gone, and the stock streaming sound effects used for it have been repurposed from Mr. Incredible becoming uncanny of all f***ing things, this is a neat piece of internet nostalgia and history that's fun to look back on. The Ed, Ed, and Eddie Lost Episode Creepypasta is a two pack, pack of, of ass. ass. This is one of the worst creepypastas I have ever read, and it's essentially a compilation of everything wrong with creepypasta cliches crammed into one painfully short story. It goes a little something like this. Episode 34 of Ed, Ed, and Eddie aired a whole week earlier than it was supposed to, airing at 5 in the morning and unfortunately being viewed by some children. What kids are awake watching Cartoon Network at 5 in the morning? It's like this story is localized entirely within the confines of Noel West for f sake. The animation was choppy, the scenery was dark and depressing, the protagonist spoke with a lisp, no one knows why, but he spoke with a sexual tone. I'm not gonna bother reading the events of this pasta in detail because I guarantee you would be bored to tears. It's just a constant display of misery and maddeningly edgy writing. It feels like it was made by a pissed off 14 year old. Some kid sat there writing a miserable fan fiction, describing in detail how Rolf began fisting a cow and thought it was the hardest ever. I genuinely can't tell if this was made as a joke or if it's completely sincere. Like there's so many parts of this where it's describing in agonizing detail what's happening, like when it describes Jimmy's mangled face and headgear and how he sent her as a paraplegic, and unlike the grieving, it's done in such an insanely edgy manner that I don't even feel a slight chill or wince at the thought of what's being described to me, I just laugh. And it feels like it was written by someone who hadn't even seen the show prior to writing this complete bucket of wank with statements like the protagonist had a list. Who's the protagonist exactly? Do you know what show you're writing about? It's painfully bad. It's a hard to read crash course on how not to write a creepypasta. Not just a lost episode one either. While it avoids using the hyper-realistic bloodline or something adjacent to it, I can't exactly give it points for doing the absolute bare minimum. Now to those of you that know, you'll realize that this is more of an analog horror than a traditional lost episode creepypasta. But the way I see it, analog horror is just a visualized lost episode creepypasta if you think about it enough. And also because this one in particular is so hilariously out of pocket and caused quite a stir when it first released that I just had to mention it here. This is a perfect example of a creepypasta going too far when it comes to involving real people. The video tells a story of an incident back in 2006 where the Spongebob episode Something Smells was hijacked on television by a ghostly presence. The ghost starts doing spooky things to the episode by showing a melting, burning Spongebob image that wouldn't even make a seven-year-old flinch, and then cutting to an image of a serene river, and then to commercials where I'm gonna need you guys to mentally prepare yourself for this because it admittedly does get my blood and piss boiling a little bit, the ghost of Steven Hillenburg's wife hijacks the on-screen text and desperately asks Steven why he murdered her, with the surprise reveal of her being dyslexic. Then, uh, okay, seizure warning, either look away from the screen or skip ahead. This happens. <laughs> And after that masterpiece and being completely tone deaf, the video immediately one-ups itself with this image saying, See you in hell, Steven Hillenburg. This frame makes me want to cut my fucking head off. I don't think I need to explain why this is the worst thing ever created by a human, right? Most of you are aware that Steven Hillenburg tragically passed away from ALS in 2018, and I don't think I need to point out just how many people grew up watching Spongebob and love Hillenburg's work. So any creepypasta story that tried to rope him in with the lost episode trope of involving the series creator was gonna get some mean looks. But I I don't know what compelled the original uploader to even humor this idea. Writing a story about Steven Hillenburg killing his wife and then the ghost of said wife telling him to burn in hell is probably one of the most insensitive things I have ever seen. I can't really make many jokes about it because it's just 
actually, how dare you? And you can tell this wasn't made as a way to troll or make people angry because once people found the video and rightfully began tearing us and the creator to shreds, they proceeded to delete the video along with their entire online presence. You cannot find them anymore. This was a genuine attempt at making a shocking and scary analog horror, and at no point did the creator ever consider that writing a deranged story about spouse murder and telling a dead man to burn in hell was probably a bad idea. And it's for that reason that I can't say the backlash towards this person is unwarranted or that it went too far, because this is ludicrously tasteless. I do not know how you can get this far in the process of making something this blatantly terrible and at not one point have second thoughts about it. It's incredible. I get this was stretching the definition of creepypasta slightly, and I know I've already talked about Spongebob in this video, but this entire incident has been living rent-free in my head for the past year, and I just had to talk about it in some capacity. It blows my mind. And with that, I think I'm creepypasta out from creepypasta ing all over the place. TLDW, cartoon creepypastas are almost never good, and I love them for that. Except you two. While they definitely aren't scary, it's fun to look back on them and reminisce about the days where Slenderman dominated the internet instead of crap like this. I probably would have covered more of these, but so many of these stories tend to blend together that I would have just been padding the video out. Hit me up when we finally get some lost episode creepypastas that aren't the same copy-paste slop, and I'll be impressed. Anyway, that's the end of the video. Play your Sonic X Shadow Generation, baby! running this game is like pure crack entering my system. Shadow the Hedgehog is that guy. He is that guy.